Coming up, electronic stability control. What is it? How does it work? And what is the benefit to you? I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Now, I actually came here to polish off my i30 Fastback N review, and then I thought we'll do a little package on the EDIF, and while we're set up here with the car in snapshot o-cornering mode, Let's talk about stability control as well, because many people have a view on stability control. And I'd have to say among performance driving enthusiasts, that view is often negative. And I just wanted to talk about that. But going back to basics, what we've got here is a snapshot of what a car might look like in the middle of a corner. The witch's hat is the apex of a corner. The car's up on some wooden ramps that sort of depict the roll that is typical of a car turning hard left. The inertia causes the vehicle to roll, right? So there's more weight on the right-hand side and less weight on the left-hand side. And this is like a differential wafer in time, if you'd like to think about it that way. And the, the roll and all that and the steering lock just depicts what the car is like in the middle of a corner. Now, stability control, in my view, which is also called the electronic stability program. It goes by ESC or ESP for electronic stability program or VDC for vehicle dynamics control. Everyone it seems has a different set of letters for this. Anyway, it's the same system fundamentally. What it does is it stops cars losing control because we have had since I don't know the 1950s there's been an epidemic of people losing control of cars in a corner and that is really bad because often in a corner, like in this left-hand cornering mode that we're in right now, if you start to lose control, and typically in a modern car, you'd lose control front-end and slip first, that's called understeer. And that means you're gonna run wide in the corner. And here in Schittsville, where we drive on the left-hand side of the road, that means you're gonna run into the oncoming traffic. It's the same as being in a right-hand bend in the United States or any of the numerous other markets where the majority of the world drives on the other side of the road. If you start pushing or understeering on that uh, right-hand cornering, you will be having a head-on crash if a vehicle is coming towards you at the time. And there's all sorts of other negative consequences as well, you know, sliding sideways and hitting a power pole or a tree. It's insanely difficult to mitigate that kind of impact. And, you know, where we sit on the car, on the right-hand side of the car, if you lose control and you hit a pole on the driver's side of the car, and you hit like this, it's really easy to get a head injury. It's really easy to lacerate your liver, which is just here on the right-hand side. Interestingly enough, the, the techniques for liver transplant surgery were developed in Australia because of the epidemic of road trauma in the 1970s. If you want to know more about that, just Google Dr. Russell Strong. He developed a procedure for all liver transplant surgery used widely around the world. It's called the Brisbane Technique because he was a surgeon in Brisbane. And the liver's got, you know, unique problems when it comes to surgery. It's highly vascular. It's got no internal landmarks and it's kind of like a sponge full of blood. So there's all of that. There's a cheery thought just for the start of the report. Okay, ESC. Here's what happens. With modern cars, there's all these kinds of sensors around the car that you don't really see, but they're feeding all of this information into a vehicle dynamics control computer. You've got the yaw rate of the car, which is how hard it's rotating in this horizontal plane as it translates itself around the bend. You've got the steering position, you've got the throttle position, you've got the speed. There's all these things that the car knows about where it's going. And if you know all of those things, if you're a propeller-headed engineer in R&D, you'd be connecting a laptop to this computer and that computer via the CAN bus and the OBD2 port, whatever, and you'd be getting all that data. So what you'd note is that there's a particular amount of your response that goes with a particular amount of steering input and a particular speed of the car, and you would develop a 3D map, if you like, of all of those different settings. And there would be a green zone where the steering and the yaw response and the speed all made sense. And there'd be kind of a red zone where you're getting too much yaw or not enough yaw for a particular amount of steering at a particular speed. So let's talk about that because you're the driver, you can see the road ahead, you know how it's all going. 
you know if it feels good or if it feels bad, that's for certain. Even if you're the world's most average driver, you at least know those things, right? So what happens when there's too much yaw? The car's got to yaw a particular amount to go through a particular bend. If it yaws too much, it starts sliding sideways and the back starts to overtake the front. And I'd have to suggest that if you're an untrained driver, that's particularly scary when that happens. There's another response as well, which is uh, not enough yaw. When there's insufficient yaw for the speed and the steering input, that means the front end is sliding as opposed to the back end. The back end is what happens when the back overtakes the front. When the front end slides, you steer more to get around the bend and you don't get any more yaw input from the body and that's really scary. And if you do what average drivers do in this situation, either back end overtaking the front or front end pushing wide, that's called oversteer when the back end overtakes the front and understeer when the front pushes and doesn't turn in enough. Nothing makes sense unless you've had a spectacular amount of driver training and you match fit for this stuff. So what happens is you're in this understeer slide, the car's not turning enough, you wind on more and more and more steering lock and then all of a sudden you might slow down enough and get to the point where normal programming is resumed and you want to go this way and the steering wheel's pointed this way and all of a sudden you've got traction so the car has a sort of secondary response where it steers far too much into the bend. And there are a million different permutations of things that can go wrong in the middle of a bend and stability control is designed to overlook all of those. So with that map, that 3D map of speed and steering and your and what's, what's in the green zone, what's in the red zone, the car is actually pretty friggin' Jedi at this point because in a sense it can see the road ahead and it can tell whether or not the car is turning enough or too much. And it does that without actually having eyes at all and without actually being able to see the road and I think that's Arthur C. Clarke's definition of magic, frankly. Any sufficiently advanced technology is magical. And this flat out is magical. If you've ever been saved by it, it's magical. So here's what happens. When you step out of the green zone and into the red zone, the car goes, hang on a minute, we've got a problem here. And it's either not yawing enough or yawing too much. The first thing it does is it cuts the throttle. Okay, doesn't matter what you do with the accelerator because all modern cars have throttle by wire and the position of the pedal is represented by a computer onto the actual throttle butterfly. So this vehicle dynamics control computer just overrides what you're doing with your foot and it tells the throttle to shut. And that means no more power delivery to the driving wheels. And often that's enough to solve the problem. So let's just think about what happens if throttle off intervention alone is not enough to solve your problem and the car is getting seriously out of shape. These things happen pretty quickly, okay? ESC has another very mad trick up its sleeve and what it can do, something you can't, is it can apply the brakes to individual wheels. And just think about that for a second because this car is in a hard left hand turn attitude, that means it's exiting off the right hand edge of your screen after this snapshot differential wafer of time has elapsed. So if the rear end starts to slip and the car is yawing too much into the bend and the rear end starts to spin out this way and the rear is overtaking the front, what can happen here is that the car can apply the front right hand brakes. And when that happens, that's like driving a crowbar down through the front right hand corner of the car. It causes massive unbalanced rotation around to the left and that cures the excessive yaw that you're experiencing. And likewise, if the car is understeering off the road in this way, it's just pushing straight ahead when it should be exiting this way, what can happen is brake application on the left hand side of the car. When that happens, let's just drive a crowbar down through the front left hand corner of the car. It causes more yaw around to the left, unbalanced rotation around this way, which is exactly what you need to cure the insufficient yaw going on in an understeer slide. And 
that's why I'd suggest never turning ESC off because you're not better than it, no matter how good you are. You could be, I don't know, you'd be Mark Webber and not as good as ESC if you have a if you have a tire blowout let's say you have a front tire blowout causing some sort of massive unbalanced rotational effect ESC will intervene and break the right individual wheel or wheels to mitigate the amount of yaw that you're experiencing and get you back in a straight line to the extent that that's possible without breaking the laws of physics so there's that <laughs> Here's a couple of other things I'd suggest you do whether you've got ESC or not because you can help it. It's not a standalone thing. Number one, drive. When you're in a demanding situation where you need to swerve or where you need to corner in some sort of engaged way, drive with your hands at nine and three with your thumbs in the thumb rests because that gives you situational awareness about where straight ahead is and where it's not. And you can easily lose that as a reference if you're out of control and the car's spinning. It's much more easy if you just maintain your hands in that nine and three position. Number two, okay, is keep your head upright because You've got this miraculous three axis accelerometer in your head and you can trick it if you're leaning this way or that way. So you've got to kind of deprogram yourself. You know when you're a kid and you learn to ride a bike and you've got to lean to corner harder? That doesn't work in a car, all right? So what you've got to do is keep your head upright, the better to perceive the 3D space around you. And then number three, and this is so important, is look where you want the car to go. It doesn't matter. The car can be rotating like this, but you've got to keep looking where you want to go because if you look where you want to go, hands follow your eyes, and when traction resumes, you'll be steering in the right direction to get you back on course. And that is so important. So ESC or not, you can do all of those things to stack the deck in your favour in serious loss of control situations. You know, mainly ESC intervenes and drivers have no idea that it's even seen a problem and happened and corrected it. It's that frigging ninja, okay? The other thing ESC is really good at, of course, is swerving because when it detects a swerve, which is a massive quick steering input, it will break the right wheel to give you the yaw response that you could not otherwise achieve by steering that quickly. So if you've got a swerve around some obstacle, you know, a kid or a kangaroo, whatever, in the middle of the road, then ESC is a real lifesaver there too because it boosts the yaw response when you need it to be boosted. And let's not forget there are three parts to the swerve equation. There's swerve, avoid the obstacle, and regain control. And with ESC on your side, I'd suggest you're in a much better position to do all three of those things. The final thing I'd suggest we consider about ESC is that there is a state of tune, a calibration for ESC. It's really vital, in my view, for the nature of the calibration of the stability control system in particular cars to match the underlying character of that car. You know, conservative family cars are often driven by people with, let's face it, not all that much driver training and not all that much underlying ability or enthusiasm for driving. So conservative calibrations for ESC are entirely appropriate there. With a car like this though, there are multiple different calibrations that are driver selectable for the ESC system. And you can select the calibration that suits the driving circumstances. In N Sport mode, for example, the loosest calibration is by default in, enacted and that allows you to walk a little bit over the line and allow you to play with understeer and oversteer to your heart's content on a track but it'll still intervene in a big way if you have a blowout on the main straight and trust me you do want that. So horses for courses on the calibration front for ESC, but it's saved a bunch of lives. You've probably got it in your car and that's the beer garden physics dissertation on how this works. Well, if you like this report, these beer garden physics type reports, let me know if you've got some suggestions about topics that you'd like me to cover. I'm happy to hear them in the comments feed below. I'll try and get onto them as quickly as I can. You might also like to consider subscribing and hit the bell notification icon for those desktop alerts for new uploads. Thank you very much for watching.